people thought I was having some kind of psychotic episode when I told them I was going to make a folk album. They were just kind of like, you, is everything all right at home? Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And they said, this is dumb. My friends laughed at it because I wanted to be in bands because I wore crass t-shirts and had spiky hair. He sent away from school at eight, the start of this musician's creative rise, to receiving his first guitar at 11, giving him the tool that would enable him to shine. Going back, what would you say to yourself back then when you're going on this alternative <laughs> path? Everybody thinks you're silly for doing it. All through my career, there's sort of been a bit of a thing that I don't quite fit neatly into a genre. You've had quite a journey with drugs. How did it begin for you, just getting into drugs? Do you remember where it began? Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. If you enjoy the show, could you do one thing? Subscribe. Wherever you are, just click the subscribe or follow button. That simple act can help us grow the podcast in a big way. And we need your support to do it. And if you really want to help play a part in our growth, rate us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would mean the world. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Uber, shaping the future for consumers as they go anywhere and get anything. Advertising on Uber connects brands with hundreds of millions of people using Uber around the world in the moments that move the most. To learn more about what we can do for your brand, visit uber.com forward slash advertising. This is a great story for anybody who wants to learn about how to reinvent themselves. You've mm -hmm. done that and successfully. Um, and also how to be successful over a long term period. You haven't just have one hit album. You thought maybe you might have done in the early career, but we'll get to that. Um, so for people in business who want to learn about how to run and be successful over a long term, people in music, people in life, there's a load of great insight from your story, which we're going to delve into. But let's start um, how we start every sh episode with a poem. Mm. Yes, as we begin. You guys have taken care of the poem. I haven't brought it. No, no, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, yeah, you're not like, do a poem. Yeah. <laughs> you sent away from school at eight, the start of this musician's creative rise, to receiving his first guitar at 11, giving him the tool that would enable him to shine. Finding a community by choice, in the punk scene, getting into the nitty gritty, led him to hopping the trains from school to join the scene in London City. Discovering punk rock at 15, a new passion was lit with it. Then living the life of a punk and rock star on stage where we would play and shout and sing. Now on the eve of his 10th solo album, what a milestone he has achieved. Welcoming Frank Turner, who will now share more of his story for you all to hear and see. Thank you very much. Welcome. That's the first time I've ever had a poem. Oh, but, amazing. Uh, that was very nice. But okay. Very cool. cool. So let's let's set the scene. Yeah. You were born of your life. Were well, you were born in Hampshire? I was actually I was born in Bahrain in the Middle East. Oh. We didn't cover this, I guess. Like, <laughs> but it's it's not hugely significant. My dad was working out there, and um, like temporarily. And uh, how old were you? In uh, about uh, four months. Was, okay. Like, I think while my mum recuperated, essentially. Wow. Um, so I don't remember anything about it. I do have the word Muharraq written in my passport, which gives bored American uh, border guards something to pick on uh, when I'm going through immigration. Uh, but other than that, I have no real connection. Sadly, no connection with, with have Bahrain. You, have you played that? No, I've not. I've not been back to, to Bahrain. So uh, the comeback tour. <laughs> <laughs> the um the maternity ward i was born in was knocked down to build uh, an american military airport um in uh, 1991 okay. so uh not quite sure where i would go no. okay okay but anyway well, so, but, so to, I, sorry, I, I've, I've derailed you the very start, first we've word started wrong <laughs> immediately off the gate just but we then moved back to hampshire right and that's where i was raised okay um so tell us, we want to set the scene, tell us about your parents. Ah, uh, so... Back then though, don't back you? Then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, so my dad um, uh, worked in uh, London in finance and stuff and was very small C conservative, traditional. I mean, I think it's probably big C conservative as well now that I think about it, but that's not really relevant. Um, and my mum uh, was 
uh, a primary school teacher and uh, her dad's a priest, so she's also quite sort of socially conservative. And they've been married for a while. My parents were married all of them for 35 years. Um, and I've got an older sister and then I come along. And it was, uh, it was sort of fine initially. I guess the, the, point, the point is is that my dad has kind of social ambitions and airs and graces about uh, himself and what had, I should say, but also about his firstborn son and all this sort of crap. Um, and uh, so when I was a little kid, they put me up for a scholarship exam an academic scholarship exam, which I got, uh, and I didn't really know what it was. Uh, so when I was eight, I got sent away from home to go to boarding schools for the next 10 years. Uh, so I stopped living at home when I was eight years old. At most eight year olds, <clears throat> you're like, you know, you're being cooked for, you're being cleaned for, you're working out like, you're quite a child. What mm. was it, can you remember that day? Tell us what you remember about the day you first went to <laughs> school. <laughs> I mean, my mum's disputed the details of this a little bit, but they sort of drove me up to this place and then they left. And I was like, what? Where are you going? <laughs> like, when are they coming back? And they said, oh, a couple of months sort of thing. And uh, I wasn't stoked. I cried for two and a half weeks straight. And then I, and then I got it out of my system. Um, I mean, it's a funny thing because like, I have mixed feelings about everything we're talking about here on those levels. One of them is that like, I want to be understanding my parents and their value system and the things that were important to them. The fact that I disagree with it doesn't necessarily mean it's not worthy of some consideration or understanding, empathy, whatever. Um, also, you know, my opinion about it's changed quite a lot since my older sister had kids. I'm, I don't have kids, that's not on my to-do list, but my older sister's son, when he turned eight, I was like, wait a second, <laughs> like, that's really young, you know, because at the time, you just sort of get on with it. Do you know what I mean? There's, I mean, there's, there's no point in doing anything else. There's no other options. I asked if I could leave and got told no. Um, so how, how long after you arrived did you want to uh, 24 hours. Okay. Mm. Uh, and um, they were just like, no. So, uh, so you know, and, and, you know, I received an incredible world-class education. I got a further scholarship when I was 13. Um, I got into a good university. All this, I, I was very, very well educated. I mean, it's worth saying that that's a large part of my objection to sort of privatized education anyway is because it's it's uh, unjust to me that the, the 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 way that we sort of select who gets this kind of education who doesn't sort of thing um but it's it's funny I, I never i was sort of too young to really understand it when i was first there but i never and then i sort of grew into understanding the kind of like the social networking part of being in those kinds of schools and was immediately just like oh no f that like I, I was just never really of any interest to me and um, can you share the school we're talking about? Uh, the second school I went to was Eton College. I got a scholarship to Eton College. And for anybody who's not in the UK that might not know, what's the significance of Eton? Uh, it's it's a it's an old one of the oldest um, public schools. They call them confusingly, which are um, venerable pri privately funded, well, private tuition uh, education establishments. Yeah. And yeah, you have to pay to attend. And, and Eton has a lot of kind of history and links with kind of the establishment, should we say, and royal family and prime ministers and well, that sort of thing. I read it was founded in 1440 by Henry the Sixth. Sixth. Yes, I wasn't there then, <laughs> uh, not allowed. Um, yeah, and, and uh, but I was, the scholarship kids are slightly um, put in a box on one side, kind of, they, you get bullied by the non-scholarship kids oh, because the scholarship kids don't pay to go there. So they beat you up. Um, and I'll, Go bigger. I, I mean, I'll say this for you, but in terms of, you know, this isn't the, you know, poor Frank Turner had to go to this, you know, school lots of people would love to love to go to, but you did, it did seem to be a very traumatic experience for you. And it why, was, well, it was more experience of it. It was in many places. And it's one of those things that my, my feelings about it change as I get older. And I think I try quite hard to, to not then, uh, uh, like change w the facts of how what actually happened. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Like I, I have some friends. I formed punk bands and stuff. I got into um, the Pistols and the Clash. And uh, um, Joe Strummer went to a boarding school, and that was very useful information for me when I was that age. It was Why? like because I was at the boarding school, and Joe Strummer's like I've got a tattoo of him somewhere. There he is. There he is. Um, and uh, you know, just he was a very somebody I, I did both then and now looked up to enormously and if he had successfully created himself, despite this milieu, should we say, then there was hope. 
So you know before I mean? that, did you feel like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into this punk scene and they're all like this, but I'm, can I be like them? Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, we're leaping ahead a little bit there, but like there was a moment. So I, I discovered some punk rock. I got, fell in love with it. Then I started going. I discovered that there were punk rock. Um, there was, it wasn't just a thing from the history books from 1977 or whatever. There was a real punk scene in London, a hardcore punk scene that I could go and go to shows, and 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 it, that was super exciting to me. And I, and that's what I started doing. Basically, you're supposed to go home every once in a while for school holidays and stuff. Mm. From about the age of 16, I stopped doing that because. Partly because I didn't want to, but partly because I figured out I could jump the train up to London and go to squat shows and anarchist book fairs and, you know, all that sort of business. Um, and there was a bit of a moment when some of the kids on the UK hardcore scene in the 90s figured out that me, it was me and my friend Chris were doing this together, that we were coming from a boarding school and various people told us to, that we weren't welcome should we say. Um, but then interestingly, actually, they tend to be the more middle class kids and the more kind of genuinely like from the bottom of the social pile kids stood up for us and sort of said F off, they chose to be here. Yeah. They've got a right. And some of those, th those guys are still my friends. <laughs> Let's say that. Nice. And people, again, I want, you, I want to give you a chance to kind of give your perspective on this is that some people say, um, or you told us that people say, oh, your music career was bought. Yeah, there's a, well, I mean, there's a lot of issues that, that are much more broad and important than me and my existence. You know, there is an issue in the UK music industry with the kind of sort of the decline of the art schools sort of in the 1980s and the sort of the fact that a lot of who can be in the music industry has been sort of like class stratified because of you essentially need financial help from your parents kind of thing to make it work because it's all about internships. All these kinds of debates, I think that they're worth having and all the rest of it. Um, but, uh, you know, in point of fact, like it has it many times over there are people who discover I went to school and then immediately assume that in some nebulous way that's never quite fully explained that my, therefore I owe my music career such as it is to where I went to school, which is hilarious because my parents banned me from buying records and um, magazines when I was a kid. In fairness, it's because the first music magazine I ever bought I uh, had a feature on Cannibal Corpse in it, and I was 11. Yeah. Um, and my mum was just like, you know. It's my, Understandably. Yeah, my mum didn't know who the Beatles were. Do you know what I mean? It's like, this was this was really opening a portal into a world that she knew nothing about, <laughs> shall we say. But so, you know, and every, all my teachers um, tried to encourage me not to do it. They said, this is dumb. My friends laughed at it. There was no institutional support at any point wow. from anybody. Uh, including 99% of the other fellow pupils who I was kind of a bit of a laughing stock at various points because I wanted to be in bands and because I wore crass t-shirts and had spiky hair and all the rest of it. So, you know, um, I don't want this to be a sob story in any way. And I also don't want to disavow the people who I've met later in life who have helped my career enormously. Um, but from the point of view of my education and my upbringing, I am kind of sui generis, do you know what I mean? It's like no one, it's not, not just no one wanted me to do this, lots of people actively wanted me not to do this. Uh, but I did. And like, that is, to, to the infinitesimally tiny level that that matters, I'm quite proud of it. What would you, going back, what would you say to yourself back then when you're going <laughs> on this alternative path, everybody thinks you're silly for doing it, and it's, it's no doubt a struggle because you probably have doubts, maybe some. It's, yeah, yeah. What's, what would you say? I mean, I don't know. Part of me thinks that what you should do, the, the, you learn by finding out, and that's the fun part. Part of me wants to go back into my 15-year-old self and say, you got any tips? Because there are times when I think that at 15, I was considering more fearless right. and like sort of like just insanely stubborn and head down mm. about everything um, in a way that I find, as a 42-year-old person, I find quite difficult to sort of think my way back into. I mean, that's true of loads of people, I'm sure. But like, there's there's quite a few bits where I'm just like, I look back now and I'm like, man, yeah, that's that's um, that's that's pretty bold. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. Well, let's we'll dive into some of that. So, at the age of 11, you receive your first guitar. Yes. What was it that drew you to this instrument, and what was it that kind of clicked in you to make you think, you know what, I can, I can do this. Yeah, I discovered Iron Maiden. A friend of mine's older brother had an Iron Maiden poster. I thought it was rad. Uh, I thought it was something to do with Games Workshop. And then I found out it was a band. And I was like, get out of here. There's no bands that have artwork that's that cool. 
uh, and then they did, and I listened to them, and they blew my mind. And at around that time, my next door neighbor, Chris, who remains a dear friend of mine to this day, he got a drum kit uh, for Christmas, I think, and wanted, and he was into like Metallica and ACDC and stuff, and he wanted someone to play with. So he discovered that I'd had my road to Damascus moment about music broadly and sort of metal music, metal and punk music. And he was like, get a guitar, get a guitar, get a guitar. And there was, um, there was a kid in my school who had been given a Les Paul gold top for Christmas and didn't want it and had just left it in a cupboard. So I didn't nick it permanently, but I just found out where it was and I used to play it every day. So yeah, I started teaching myself guitar and then mum and dad got me a Ar Argos starter pack. Yeah. You've got a black and white strap copy, a 30 watt amp, a strap and a lead um, for you know 60 quid or whatever. And, uh, and then I set it up next to Chris's drum kit and we started pounding out. We really wanted to cover stuff like Judas Priest and Megadeth and we were not and probably still aren't good enough to play that kind of music, uh, which is why Nirvana was such a godsend. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, I can play these chords. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, and on, and on we went. You're part of a, uh, yeah, it's this, this small, smaller group. How did you convert this passion for this music into, into your early career or? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, ba basically, like, I was fortunate enough. I, I, via Nirvana, I sort of discovered the word punk. I discovered, then I got, you know, Clash and Sex Pistols records, and then I got Green Day and Offspring and NoFX and stuff sort of was around that time, so they were all breaking through. Uh, as I say, so I was into all this music, and then I kind of made this discovery with some friends that there were punk shows in London that you could go to. And then, and then you start sort of filtering down. There's no, incidentally, moral worth in the state of being the person who burrowed deeper than anybody else but like I you know for every 10 kids who listen to the offspring maybe one of them would get as far as black flag do you know what I mean um and then discovering household name records in the UK and UK hardcore at the time so sort of and you know genuine underground DIY hardcore scenes are, are beautiful things and they and they they are naive and childish things in some ways but in the but I mean that in the best possible way like the scene that I met was fortuitous enough to stumble across the oldest people involved were probably 25 mm. um, and we were 16 when we really started going, me and my friend Chris, and um, we were probably the youngest and it was a few hundred people around the UK and people would bug the, the only person they knew who was old enough to drive a van to drive up to the other city and all the bands would swap shows. Like I remember there was a period of time where they play, they, they were, the following places could be played on a tour of the UK if you were in a hardcore band. Uh, Southampton, London, Peterborough, um, Newport in Wales, Leeds, and Dundee. And that's that, it, that's that was, that's underground. where there were people putting on oh, underground straight edge hardcore shows in, in about 1998. So, you know, it was very, um, it was, it was, it was very small and, and there was a lot of kind of anarchism and, uh, animal rights and sort of general kind of that sort of political milieu doing the rounds as well. But it was just sort of, it felt a bit training wheels. But again, I mean that in a good way, in the sense that it was actually a really, my mum, of course, thought I joined a cult. Um, uh, I was straight edge, which for those who don't know, means I didn't drink or take drugs or anything like that. At so a point, what is, so straight is, is a, is a... It, it's an ethos that's taken from a song by a hardcore band called Minor Threat. But it basically means you don't pollute your body. So you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't take drugs. In more extreme versions, you don't have sex or drink caffeine. Uh, I didn't have sex at the time because I was a 16 year old with no ability to talk to women <laughs> but um, <laughs> took that on as well. yeah yeah but uh but um the whole thing was like um uh my, so at the point point in time when my kind of fellow people's parents were desperately trying to stop them drinking my parents were trying to make me drink glasses <laughs> of wine because they thought i joined a cult that's brilliant and it's and it's quite it was quite interesting to learn that because it so it falls within the sort of punk oh yeah system doesn't it and yeah and if for someone who doesn't know much about the scene, you would never maybe associate punk with, with yeah, with this sort of very clean, healthy way of living. Sure, I mean, it's, it's definitely the hardcore end of punk, do you know what I mean? And it was, a lot of it was a reaction to the complete sort of nihilistic decadence of the 1970s punk thing when everybody was out of their minds. I see. Um, the famous story is that Ian Mackay just sort of saw Derby crash and was like, what's the f point in this? Um, uh, you know, it, it, there are various different versions of it. And I personally, 
was then not straight edge for a long we'll time. Talk about that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a polite way of putting it. Um, but yeah, the whole thing was just a really, you know, finding that, and then, you know, then playing in bands within that scene and doing those tours. Did my first tour in the summer of '98 when I was 16 years old in a van. Um, we did, I think, we did 14 shows. No one came to quite a few of them. Um, but it was great. We had the time of our lives. Yeah. Um, and we all got the flu and we lost money. Um, and it was great. That's how all great careers, careers start. Yeah. Right. And it was funny. At the end of the tour, about half the people in the van got out and were like, I am never, ever, ever doing that again. And the other half were like, when do we do it again? No. Um, uh, and, you know, do it slightly better planned and, yeah. and all the rest. But um, so I caught the bug. But it, and, and then at a certain point, like when that band called Nija came to an end, a foreign band called Million Dead with the drummer. And we sort of then had ambitions to be more part of the music industry proper and have like a booking agent and a manager. And in fact, come to South by Southwest, which we did in 2004. So we went into the more kind of traditional world of trying to make it in a rock band. But particularly Ben and I, who'd been in that first band with me, um, we had this kind of hinterland. We'd already done quite a lot of touring. And, and throughout my life, I kind of keep I remember just sort of making friends with, with other people in bands who are my age who are like, yeah, I did my first tour when I was like 23. And I'm like, what are you doing for seven years? Do you know what I mean? It's like, we, there, there's a very DIY proactive kind of thing in the punk scene. Um, there's a book by Henry Rollins called Get in the Van that's a sort of diary of his time in the band Black Flag touring in the early 1980s in America, which I read like it was a Bible come instruction manual mm. and we formed the band we were 16 what do bands do they tour how do you book tours you just call people you know until you've got enough shows and then you go and that's what we did I'm still I mean, that's what I mean about wanting to go back and find my 16 year old self and ask if he's got any mm. tips mm. <laughs> it was yeah. just really really proactive and uh and just going back a little bit you're talking to us about your relationship with your father at this point what was mm. it like oh served so, uh, oscillated been terrible and non-existent really um I got, um, I, uh, I got an offer to, I, my parents wanted me to go to university. I wanted to go to university, sort of. I also wanted to be in a band. I was sort of aware that wasn't likely to be a full-time gig anytime soon. Um, but my parents wanted me to go to Cambridge University who offered me a place which I turned down. And my dad called me up and screamed at me and told me to never come home again until I had a degree from Cambridge. And I was like, no bother wasn't planning on it anyway mm. and uh, I went and spent the summer living in a squat in Tufnell Park um, uh, and Cambridge to a squat very different yeah. um, and uh, I did I went to London, the University in London so I did go to university mm. but um, but uh, I was yeah so my relationship with my dad was was bad at this point so from from that point did you stop communicating yeah yeah I mean um, my dad was used to that anyway he never called me um, and uh and and i was just i was busy do you know what i mean it was like if i wasn't studying or working because part-time jobs to live or whatever i'd be on tour do you know what i mean and i i didn't see much of my mum either around that point my parents marriage was in the middle of falling apart around that time as well uh i sort of i was sort of in my early 20s and didn't want to have anything to do with any of it so looking back now can you see why your dad would have been upset Yes and no. I mean, I'm not, I, I understand he has a slightly different system of values to me <clears throat> and I'm not a parent and I'm trying to be wary of kind of holding forth about parenting skills to people who are parents. My dad was a <laughs> dad, like he was crap at it. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, so no is the short answer to your question, <laughs> really. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to talk now about your, you've mentioned it, You've had quite a journey with drugs and alcohol. Yes. Yeah. You've been on, and I think there's a lot, the reason I want to talk about it is I think a lot of people will resonate with it. Sure. Whether they're in one of the cycles you've been on or not. Um, and I think there's a lot of people can learn through it. And so how did it begin for you to getting into drugs? Do you remember where it began? Uh, oh yeah. Well, um, so I started smoking when I was 10 um, because my dad's family were all smokers and my mom's family weren't and my dad's family were cool. And my mom's funny one. So me and my older sister were like tubing away. Ten years old. Yeah. yeah. I mean, not full time when I was but, 10, but like, yeah. you know. Getting used to it. Yeah. Yeah. And like, uh, and then, you know, sort of drinking at family parties and then drinking at parties with your friends. Uh, did a bunch of speed when I was about 14, 15. Um, 
Which strikes me as utterly pointless now, because being the act of being 14 is sort of quite a lot like being on speed. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, and, then, and then I discovered Straight Edge, and I went Straight Edge for about four years, I think. Uh, and then I had a horrible breakup and stopped being Straight Edge, because that's how it always goes. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then I, I went, so the, my old, the, um, my Million Dead, my old hardcore band kind of broke up. And it, that coincided with a bunch of stuff. Why did it break up? Uh, we fell out with each other. Two albums and four and a half years on tour in a tiny van, and it just it didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was sort of, first of all, transitioning to playing a different type of music. I was sort of starting to play acoustic guitar, do solo shows. Uh, my parents were breaking up was also a thing that was happening. Mm. And I started hanging around this scene in North London based around a bar called Nambuka, which is a bar on the Holloway Road um, run by some friends of mine. You know, it was this scene that was kind of it was sort of on the kind of like Strokes, Libertines, kind of British guitar indie thing. But there was also, there was a kind of folky element to it. They had an open mic night called Sensible Sundays that was sort of initially put together because after a weekend of kind of like club nights and gigs and not sleeping on a Sunday, you needed something with no drums. So, <laughs> folk music. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, and my friend Jay, who goes by Beans and Toast, was playing guitar there and writing songs about all of us. And it was just, it was a huge change for me and really creatively inspiring and it was quite a party scene there were pills and powders doing the rounds and um i got involved in that and it, for a time it was under control on lots of different levels i mean first of all i couldn't afford very much of it because it broke so um and uh how often are you having it and what you're having oh i mean basically a big pills and coke session every few weekends okay if we're going to get specific about this yeah well, um, i think it's helpful just yeah because people can sort of chart through your story if they are where they're at on this yeah yeah sure um, but it's so there's a there's a line by the band the whole steady who are one of my favorite bands with and the lyric is it started recreational and ended kind of medical and at the beginning it was like i could afford pills more than i can afford powders and then, um, and, and like, I, I generally didn't really do it on tour because it tends to wreck my voice and I've always been dedicated to my music. So I had this sort of inbuilt stopping mechanism, two inbuilt stopping mechanisms, running out of money and also need to go back on tour again. And so for a long period of time, the balance was that I would go off and tour for like three or four months. I come home for like a week. I come home and I have a massive blowout with some friends for like three days and then I go on tour again. So you sleep it off, go on tour again. There's an there's a equilibrium if you like, and, and it kind of worked. And then there was just a period of time a bit later when my career had become more successful and I had a bit more money in my pocket. And we also then they had a period of time when I came back off tour and uh, for longer than I'd expected. So I came home, had a massive blowout, slept it off, was still at home. So I went back, back to the pub, had another massive blowout, slept it off, still at home, went back to the pub. And do you know what I mean? So the kind of like one of the break mechanisms that kind of failed, if you like, um, and then there was a pe- good period of three or four years where things were bad. What are the signs of when something is bad, right? Uh, when I think, I mean, uh, I was, if to be specific, like I say, it ended up kind of medical. Like there were definitely moments in time when it was like, uh, my now wife, when we got together, she's never been particularly into that world. And I was when she met and she sort of <laughs> wandered into a party on like day four or something. And she said, it doesn't really look like any of you are having any fun. Um, and it wasn't fun at that point. It was just mechanical. It was brutal. It was like conveyor belt. It was like, get high, get more, get high. Um, and we all thought we were being wild and back in alien, but we were, it was pretty sort of nihilistic in its way. Um, so yeah, so that, and then there were, having said that I didn't do it on tour, there were a couple of occasions when it did spill over into my professional life Mm. in a ways that I'm deeply ashamed of, like not loads, but there were one or two gigs I played when I was up and they were terrible gigs um and i knew that they were terrible while they were happening and the audience knew they were terrible oh, man. and there's a fair amount of forgiveness from your own audience because they bought tickets to see you yeah. so they like you and also the rock and roll history is full of you know all the mythology of people playing f-ed up and all the rest of it which i've always thought was bull and i'm just standing there being like i know i can do better than this i know i'm yeah. i'm charged you money to be here and i'm f-ing you over because i'm being awful at this um so yeah so it was it got pretty there's a, I think one of the words that people don't use enough in talking about drugs is shame. I'm extremely ashamed uh, a lot of, the th- of my behaviours over the period of time when it was out of control in my life. We'll talk about the journey you went on next, which is yeah, more positive, let's say. <laughs> um, 
But right. just going back to that transition, so you, what, what did it? What was your thinking process to go from uh, the certain type of music you were making before into folk music? Um, well, I mean, there was a bunch of stuff going on. I mean, partly I, I, because of my, I, I wasn't really shepherded through music. I was an autodidact from the word go, and I got into, you know, metal and then punk and then hardcore, and the adjacent subgenres that boys like to waste their lives talking about. Um, and uh, um, the example I always think of is I knew the song Bob Dylan writes propaganda songs by the Minutemen before I'd ever heard any songs by Bob Dylan. <laughs> um, and I had a moment of touring with Million Dead where I was kind of bored of shouty guitar music, or at least we were playing it all day, so I didn't need to listen to it all night in the van. And um, you know, I discovered these crazy new artists like the Beatles and Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and Led Zeppelin and whoever else. And it, you know, I was just walking up to people being like, <laughs> and everyone's like, yes. yes. Um, and, uh, but particularly the kind of the rootsy kind of folk influence, the folk adjacent stuff. I mean, the word folk itself can be pretty charged ideologically in terms of what's folk music. And that's not a discussion that any of you signed up for. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, the roots, people call it roots or Americana or country or whatever. That kind of just sort of quite stripped back kind of earthy old kind of guitar, acoustic guitar music. Um, the Johnny Cash American recording series, Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska record, um, stuff like Josh Rouse, um, early Ryan Adams, the, the, all of this really, really kind of spoke to me in this new way, you know? Um, and then I had an acoustic guitar, so I started around with it. And there was this open mic night in Nambuca, so I started playing there. And then when, my old, when Min and Dead broke up, I was really gutted. Um, and I went to Nambuka. Uh, we had a rehearsal where we agreed to break up and do our, the, our upcoming tour as a farewell tour. I went to Nambuka, gutted, and the fa my family in Nambuka all just went, we don't, we, we hate your band anyway. Do the songs that you do at the open mic night. We like those ones. And I was oh. like, this is emotionally sort of <laughs> a lot to digest. Yeah. But okay. Um, and it was kind of on their encouragement that I sort of gave that a go. So you weren't thinking at that point of... I, going, I'm not going to say it had never crossed my mind, but like it, it was a huge boost to my confidence for them to say, you know, we really like those songs. Um, but I mean, the, that whole period of time, like it's much more common now for people who were in punk or hardcore bands to make acoustic records. It really wasn't in 2005. And I don't want to spend my time claiming any kind of trailblazer blazer status not least because that belongs to chuck reagan and tim barry anyway but like um you know people thought i was having some kind of psychotic episode when i told them i was going to make a folk album what, um, what kind of things were people saying to you they were just kind of like you is everything all right at home um <laughs> do you know what i mean <laughs> uh, various industry people just kind of laughed me out of their offices and told me to piss off in fact one of the only ones who didn't see him right there is Charlie, who's still my manager now. Hey, um, hey, and, Charlie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, and saw that I, well, this is the thing. At the time, I think I thought I had a plan and a vision mm -hmm. and most other people thought I was mental. And now everybody thinks I must have had a plan or a vision and I think I must have been mental <laughs> yeah. um, because it's quite difficult to think yourself back into different, different periods of your life. And like there was a kind of stubborn, bull-headed thing going on there in terms of, I just, I played like a bazillion shows on my own, squats, house parties, university halls, bars if I was lucky, you know, just over and over again. I was booking myself one month ahead. My fee was 50 pounds for a gig, which went up to 50 pounds plus train fare when my young person's rail car ran out. Um, <laughs> uh, true story. And, uh, you know, and it was like, I was just, and, and one of the other things is that like, you know, Million Dead, our farewell show, we played to like 800 people. My first solo headline show in London, we played to two people who were both on my guest list. I like, you know, there was this gigantic drop off of interest in what I was doing. Some people now kind of think that I did this because it would sell more records and make me more famous or whatever. And that pisses me off because in point of fact, the opposite was true at the time. If I'd formed another punk or hardcore band, I could have got a record deal and, and got some big tours and stuff pretty much straight away. Yeah. Um, and, and I didn't, and I stuck with this and I'm kind of, but like I say, this is the thing, I'm, I'm doggedly proud of it. I slightly look back at it now and I'm like, wow, who's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, 
But I am proud of it because ultimately what that means is that I was following an artistic imperative mm. yeah. um, in quite a pure way. And what would you say to an artist that's considering to move into a different genre or try something that's completely different to what they were originally doing or originally known for? I think, I just think that art is creation, art is communication, and I just don't think that, I, I really, really don't believe in boundaries around art, really, of any kind. Like, um, you know, art is pure expression. Um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that anyone's necessarily good at anything. Like, I mean, they're, they're, I sort of I shouldn't tell you this. I, I have sort of tried my hand at making some more kind of like drama based electronic IDM kind of stuff because I like that kind of music. I can't make it. It's terrible. It's never getting released. <laughs> oh, I want to hear that like, now. It's, it's just I don't have the patience to program beats like FX Turn or, mm. you know, um, any of that crew. So, so, um, so, you know, obviously, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to excel in it, but the idea of experimenting with, with new stuff, I think everybody should should feel encouraged to do that, mm. even if it's only in the privacy of your own home. You, yeah. know? you were friends with Jamie T at the time. Right? Yeah, we, well, we were, we were on the same scene, let's say. We played, yeah. He played at the Nambuka a, a few times and hung out at his house a few times, stuff like that, yeah. And can you share who Jamie T is? Who Jamie, really Jamie T mind? is a, an incredible songwriter. Um, he, from some of the same kind of musical hinterland as me, but he's got a lot more kind of, uh, kind of hip hop rapping kind of element in what he does, more electronic element in what he does, but he's kind of like a little bit, kind of like the streets crossed with rancid or something. That's a reductive way of describing his music, but I love his music. I think he's a genius. What was it like at that time? Because you were kind of at the same level. Yeah. And then what happened? Well, so so Jamie signed a, a, a big record deal um, and I... Uh, and you were just used to being mates going to the pub together. Trying yeah, to yeah. I mean, well, we, every, people were hungry. It wasn't a, not an ambitious scene, let's say that. It was different from the punk scene that I'd been in, which was extremely hostile and suspicious of any kind of money or success, essentially. <laughs> you know, people were ambitious. But, like, Jamie got signed for a big record deal, and we were all happy for him. And like, it wasn't that I was resentful for what was happening to him, but, like, I remember that at the time that his record came out, which had this gigantic sort of corporate push behind it, as it sh should do, I was kind of putting out um, my first EP, I think, with Extra Mile, which is a small independent record label. And, you know, it, these are just, these are different orders of magnitude that we're discussing. Um, I caught a <laughs> up on, in time. Yeah, <laughs> it took a minute, but we got there. But it, there was definitely, there were some, there was a, all through my career, there's sort of been a bit of a thing that I don't quite fit neatly into a genre, mm. uh, whether or not genre is a real separate conversation. But I was sort of on the edge of that kind of new folk thing with Laura Marling and Mumford and & Sons and stuff. I knew all those guys and played with them. Sort of on the edge of the more kind of like um, Libertines, Holloway's kind of British guitar music thing. Obviously, I had links with the punk scene and all the rest of it. But I was never quite of any of those scenes. And there were days when that fact meant that I slipped between the stools and I would watch friends of mine kind of zoom off into the stratosphere. And that got pretty frustrating at times. In the long run, it meant that, you know, I kind of got to where Jamie did in his first album on my fifth album. But by the time I got there, I kind of knew what that meant. And I knew how to handle myself when I got there. Not perfectly, but, you know, I had some idea of what was going on. A very dear friend of mine got enormously, I'm not going to say who, got quite startlingly famous on his first album and it kind of ruined his life for a bit. Wow. Because, because the pressures that come with that sort of attention, mm. there's no manual for them. Nobody tells you how to deal with it. Yeah. And, and he didn't handle it especially well. He's got through that now. He's in a much better place. But like I remember watching that happen and thinking, oh, yeah, that kind of sucks. Huh? Mm. And like, you know, by the time, if you're get a reach to the point of doing number one records and arena tours and stuff on your ninth record or, or whatever you, you've got more kind of ballast do you know what i mean you're a bit older as well i was in my 30s by that point do you know what i mean and it just means also that i did it on my own terms and i don't owe my success to the rising kind of surge of or hype or whatever of a scene thing or whatever like i feel like i've earned what i've got should we say um and that's a nice feeling yeah. and I think it'd be nice to end part one, which we're coming to now, on a, on a positive message for anybody who resonates with what you said, where they feel like they don't quite fit into a particular group. What's your advice? I mean, I, th I think that, like, essentially, it's, it's a nice thing to meet kindred spirits in any endeavor, right? 
um, creative or business or anything else. But like ultimately, if you believe in the thing that you're doing, that's so much more important than sort of having a nice social life around it, I would say. Mm. Like be you and do your own thing. And ultimately, I mean like most of, the, not that I'm counting myself amongst this, but most of the greatest people who didn't slot easily into pre-existing categories, do you know what I mean? Mm. And take some solace in that and be proud of who you are and what you do. Because ultimately, if you do it that way and it f***s up, you can always say to yourself, Frank Sinatra did it my way. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it wasn't necessarily uh, perfect or the, the biggest thing in the whole world. But I mean, it's like, I mean, there's a part of me that thinks that if I had turned around and started writing songs like, and I mean this with no disrespect to him at all, but like George Ezra or something like that, like I probably would have had an easier ride of things. But I didn't because I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud that I didn't want to. And George Ezra has uh, many more cars in his garage than I do. But, and, and good luck to him, you know, um, I wish him well. But like, I did things my way and I, this is what I got out of it and I'm proud of that. Love it, great message. Great message. Well, you're an artist. We've got one here as well. Have you been writing one as we go? Yeah, I've been writing a poem to summarize. This that. is my second poem. Two in a day. I'm spoiled. 2,838 gigs in counting, almost a triple century. Could it be the early challenges to build a path of building resilience mentally. Finding icons of the same experience, a way of finding your inspiration, to being in a space despite others' thoughts, you pursued your inspirations. Empty rooms or not, if you enjoy it, keep the faith. And if you keep going, you may have 12,000 people filling that space. You've now heard part one. Part two is where we will continue. How I became South by Southwest and Frank Turner. It's been great to be with you. Thank you, man. That's a beautiful thing. I appreciate that. Hey, thank I you. I didn't do a poem, but um, thank you guys.